Our brains develop and change throughout life, enabling us to learn and do new things and to adapt at every age. But childhood, and early childhood in particular, is the most sensitive and critical period for brain development. As a child interacts with the world, their experiences, both positive and negative, stimulate the brain, causing it to form neural pathways that lay the foundation for lifelong cognitive and behavioral functioning. I like to think of brain development as the brain is like a, uh, the site of a town, so you can lay out road work. <laughs> You're laying down roads, uh, according to, in the brain's case, according to experiences. So you have an experience and your brain lays down a path. And the more you have that experience, the bigger the path is going to get and the stronger and then it's paved and it becomes a real road and a highway. And you're laying out the grid work of the town according to your experiences. And that's very much like the brain development. The more you have experiences, the, the stronger those electrical circuits are going to be. And that's going to shape the way uh, you think and act and view the world. Safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments provide the context for healthy brain development when children have ample opportunities to learn and explore. In this setting, Children acquire a range of experiences that stimulate different parts of the brain, allowing for healthy, balanced development. Some degree of adversity and stress is a normal and essential part of human development that can help children learn how to react to future challenges. But a child who's repeatedly exposed to adversities like abuse, neglect, or unstable relationships and environments may experience what's known as toxic stress, and this can disrupt brain development. Our experiences literally shape the way our brain is developing in the brain architecture. So if you have a baby, a very young baby, who cries when they're hungry, uh, and mother comes over and feeds the baby and helps the baby settle down, the baby goes back to sleep, that happens, what, five, ten times a day. And that is laid down, those electrical circuits are laid down in the brain, and so the baby learns that you cry, you get fed, you soothe, and you go to sleep. And that experience is sort of coded into the brain, just like any other experience. So good experiences uh, help the brain develop in a certain way, and if you have adverse experiences, that same baby cries and cries and cries and the parents are addicted to opiate drugs, let's say, and they ignore the baby. The baby's left alone for 10 hours in the dark. That baby's brain is still developing, but it's developing in a different way. Their experience is much different, and so it is developing in a way that says you can cry and cry and cry and escalate that stress response as much as you want, nothing's going to happen. Uh, and the interpretation of that is not only is the brain realizing that that's not going to that they're not going to get soothed, um, but the child learns, and this is laid down the brain. The child learns that the world is an unsafe place, uh, that they are insignificant. There's no one out there to help them, uh, and that is all laid down in the brain as well. There, there are different forms of stress that any individual um, is exposed to. There's positive stress that oftentimes is very short term, but, you know, it's something that everybody experiences. So even if you said, you know, waking up in the morning, going to work, going to school, that's, you know, one form of stress, very short term, but something that your body has to adjust to. Um, you can have, you know, very um, neutral forms of stress that are a little bit longer term, but things in which, you know, there are resources and support that help you adjust adapt to it, whereas there's other kinds of things that are more long-term kinds of negative stress, and that's where toxic stress really fits into. Um, things in which person doesn't have or an individual does not have the kind of resources and support to try to deal with it, and it has a negative effect in the long-term consequences on that particular individual. So it's toxic in the sense of the body responds to that stress. You know, one of the things that is produced is a hormone called cortisol, and and that constant um, production of cortisol has a negative effect on brain development, on neurological development, and on other kinds of organs and tissues in the body. When we experience stress or encounter a threat, the brain triggers the body to produce hormones that activate a stress response, or what's often referred to as the fight or flight response. In a moment of crisis, this response is necessary and potentially life-saving. But stress can become toxic when the stress response system is activated frequently or for prolonged periods of time. If a child is constantly afraid, her body and brain will remain on high alert, preparing her to react should a threat return. Her body will continually produce stress hormones, and the stress response system will remain activated in her brain, drawing energy away from other neural pathways in need of development or maintenance. In a child experiencing toxic stress, parts of the brain that might be weakened 
are those regulating complex functions like emotional self-regulation, social interactions, and abstract thinking. This may have consequences throughout life and can result in social, behavioral, and cognitive challenges. Toxic stress uh, implies a certain level of adversity, and that often occurs early in life within childhood. So children who have um, experienced adverse childhood experiences um, have been found through very uh, uh, diligent research to be at increased risk for a number of long-term problems when they reach adolescence and adulthood. And these problems really span multiple domains. They can be behavioral problems, emotional problems, and physical problems. So if you think about it, children who have had early adversity are at higher risk, much higher risk for major depression and suicidality for anger management problems, uh, for delinquency and high-risk behavior, uh, for dropping out of school, for teen pregnancy, for runaway behavior, uh, for adult criminality, and for liver disease and lung disease and heart disease, among other things. So it has a profound long-term impact, potentially. And yet, the brain is capable of healing and changing. Effective treatments can help those affected by early adversity and give them a chance to heal from traumas and learn new ways to interpret and react to stressors and other stimuli. Fortified by this information, we can shift the conversation away from one that blames and punishes people for inappropriate reactions and behaviors that developed in childhood due to adversity and trauma. Instead, we can champion the need for expanded services and opportunities that help people overcome early adversity. And we can focus on ways to prevent abuse, neglect, and other challenges before they occur. I don't want to imply that any child who experiences early adversity is on a, a, a mission where they inevitably will experience these adverse effects long term. That's not the case at all. Uh, many kids are resilient, uh, and so they are able to overcome this adversity very early on uh, and prevent the long term effects. Some adults will experience those long term effects, but there are ways that we can help the adults. Uh, and very often, I um, work at a child sexual abuse clinic, and very often our our parents will come in, the mother will come in and say, my daughter was sexually abused and it comes out while I'm talking to her that she was sexually abused as well. She never got therapy. So for 20 years she's been living with this experience and hasn't told anyone. That's not too late. She can still get help. She can still get therapy. She can still work through that. She can still kind of overcome that and move on uh, and not have an increased risk of uh, adversity. There are other social pro uh, programs that are helpful. For example, programs that help people uh, develop some of those skills that maybe they didn't develop early on. The, the skills are related to planning, controlling their emotions and controlling their impulses and getting hold of that automatic response that jump to anger, getting hold of that, calming it down, learning how to do that can help tremendously. CDC is the nation's public health agency, and as such, we're really interested in those factors, risk factors and protective factors that influence health. And it turns out that early adversity in the form of violence and other adverse events has a profound impact on health throughout the lifetime. Mental health in impacting infectious diseases as well as chronic diseases. So as such, early adversity and the, and the influence of that is, is critically important from a public health standpoint, and it's strategic. If we can reduce or eliminate early adversity, we can have a, an enormous impact on health of the, the U.S. population and, in fact, people around the world during the course of their entire lives. In Lesson 2, you'll learn about the CDC Kaiser Permanente Adverse Childhood Experiences Study and about findings from the study that can aid in our efforts to prevent and treat ACEs.